Seraphina and the Black Cloak by Robert Beatty. Today we'll be reading chapter 16 and 17, but instead of reading from my house, I took a field trip um, and I went all the way to Asheville, North Carolina. Why did I go to Asheville? Because if you can see in the background, this is the entrance, the guarded entrance to the Biltmore Estates in which in 1895, George Vanderbilt built his 250 room gigantic, enormous, um, they call it a chateau. So, but that's where he lived and his family. And as a matter of fact, if Serafina, Serafina and the Black Cloak actually took place, it actually took place here in Asheville at the house, we'll say the mansion or the chateau that George Vanderbilt built in 1895. So. We're going to read chapter 16 and 17, and we'll stop uh, halfway through 16. Chapter 16. I hope you're ready. As Serafina and Braden crawled back into the ventilation system, she asked, Do you know all the gentlemen who are currently guests at Biltmore? I've met most of them, Braden said as he closed up the vent cover behind them, but not all of them. Do you know which rooms they're staying in, she asked, as they made their way on their hands and knees along the shaft back toward his bedroom? The guests are on the third floor. Servants live on the fourth. But do you know the specific rooms? I know some of them. My aunt put Mr. Bindle in the Raphael room. The Brahmses are in the heirloom room, and Mr. Rostinov is in the Moreland room. It goes on and on. Why? I have an idea. If the man in the black cloak is one of the gentlemen at Biltmore, then he needs to store his cloak someplace when he's not using it. I've checked the closets and the coat rooms on the first floor, but I want to check the bedrooms too. You want to sneak into people's private bedrooms? Braden asked hesitantly. They won't know, Serafina pointed out. As long as we're careful, they won't catch us. But we'll be looking through their private belongings. Yes, but we need to help Clara and the others, and we need to stop the man in the black cloak from doing this again. Braden pursed his lips. He didn't like this idea. Isn't there some other way? We just need to look, she said. Finally, he nodded his head. Serafina followed Braden along the shaft. Mr. Vanderbilt had called in private detectives who now stood guard at various points in the corridors of the house. As long as they stayed in the ventilation system, they were safe. But moving through the other parts of the house unseen was going to be far more difficult than before. Serafina could tell that all the searches and the presence of the detectives weren't bringing solace to the Biltmore's anxious inhabitants. She sensed that both the guests and the servants were losing hope. From what she overheard people saying to one another, there was an increasing sense that the children weren't missing, but dead. She had to defend her own heart from the same terrible conclusion. She'd seen them vanish, but her pa had told her that everyone had to be someplace. Even dead bodies had to be someplace. We've got to keep looking, she kept telling herself. We can't give up. We've got to help them. But when the members of the various search parties began to return without any sign of the children, people were more disheartened than ever. Serafina and Braden snuck into the Raphael room and looked through Mr. Bindle's belongings. Mr. Bindle is always so cheerful, Braden said. I don't see how he could have hurt anyone. Just keep looking, she whispered, determined to stay focused. She found all sorts of expensive clothing in Mr. Bindle's finely decorated traveling chest, including many stylish gloves and a long, dark gray cloak, but it wasn't the black cloak. Next, they checked the Van Dyke room. With its finely detailed terracotta wallpaper, its dark mahogany furniture, and many paintings hangings by wires on the walls. Mr. Thorne has always been very kind to me, Braden said. I don't see how it could possibly be him. Ignoring him, Serafina searched the room as thoroughly as she could, digging through all of the chests that he'd left unlocked. She found no trace of the cloak. You like him too much, she said as she searched under the mahogany bed. I do not, Braden protested. We'll see. He saved Gideon's life when Mr. Crankshot was going to kill him with an axe, Braden said. Serafina frowned. In Braden's mind, the man who saved his dog could do no wrong. When they heard someone coming, they darted back into the ventilation shaft as quickly as they could. I don't think it's any of the gentlemen at Biltmore, Braden said as they made their way to the next room. It must be some kind of demon from the forest like we were talking about before. Or maybe it's a stranger from the city who isn't known to us. Serafina agreed that the lack of clues was discouraging, but there were still at least a dozen more rooms to check. 
They moved on to the Sheraton room and the Old English room. When they searched the Moreland room, she looked into each of Mr. Rostinov's beautiful hand-painted traveling cases. Her heart filled with sadness when she found a chest filled with a lovely Russian dress. They were such amazing gowns with deep frills and exotic patterns. It doesn't feel right to be here, Braden said uncomfortably. As they were crawling through a shaft to the next room, they heard several women talking in a hallway on the level below. They shinnied down a shaft to get a closer look. That's my aunt's room. That's my aunt's room, Braden said nervously. Let's stay quiet, Serafina whispered, then peered through a grate to look into the room. When Serafina looked down into Mr. Vanderbilt's room, she beheld the glittering purple and gold French-style bedroom with its elegant curvy furniture and fancifully trimmed mirrors. She thought it was the most beautiful room she had ever seen. It wasn't rectangular in shape like a normal room, but oval. The gold silk walls, the bright flowers, and even the delicately painted doors were curved along the lines of the oval. The bed coverings, draperies, and furniture upholstery were all finely cut purple velvet. The room positively glowed with sunlight, and she would have loved to curl up on Mr. Vanderbilt's bed. On Mrs. Vanderbilt's bed, she was just about to suggest to Braden that they risk climbing into the room when Braden grabbed her arm. Wait, there's my aunt, he said, as Miss Mrs. Vanderbilt came slowly into the room, followed by her lady's maid and her household assistant. These are such lonely and frightening times, Mrs. Vanderbilt said with sadness. I would like to do something for the family, something to bring everyone together and strengthen our spirits. This evening, we'll gather in the banquet hall at seven o'clock. The electric lighting still isn't working, so stuck up the fires and bring in as many candles and oil lamps as you can. Arrange it with the kitchen so we can provide everyone with something to eat. It won't be a formal sit-down dinner or any sort of party, mind you. It's just, it's just not the appropriate time for that, but we must do something. I'll go down to the kitchens and talk to the cook, her assistant said. I think it's, impo I think it's important that we gain the comfort of spending time, some time together. Whether we're frightened, grieving, or still holding on to hope, Mrs. Vanderbilt said. Yes, ma'am, her lady's maid said. Serafina thought it was kind of Mrs. Vanderbilt to arrange the gathering. It was well known at Biltmore that Mrs. Vanderbilt liked to learn the names and faces of all the children, of both the guests and the servants. And when Christmas came, she and her lady's maid would go shopping in Asheville and the surrounding villages and buy each one of the children a special gift. Sometimes, if she heard that a child wanted a particular present that wasn't available in the area, Mrs. Vanderbilt would send away to New York for it and it would miraculous, miraculously arrive a few days later on the train. On Christmas morning, she would invite all the families to gather around the Christmas tree where she would hand each child his or her gift. A porcelain face doll, a soft toy bear, a pocket knife, it all depended on the child. Serafina remembered her own Christmas morning sitting in the basement, curled up on the stone floor at the bottom of the stairs, listening to the children laughing and playing with their toys above. Over the next few hours, the word spread and the guests and the servants began preparing for the upcoming gathering. My aunt and uncle are going to want me to be there, so I've got to go, Braden said glumly. I wish you could come with me. You must be as hungry as I am. I'm starving. It's going to be in the banquet hall, right? I'll be there in spirit. Just don't let anyone play the pipe organ, Serafina said. I'll sneak you some food, he said as they parted. While Braden went to his bedroom to dress for the gathering, Serafina snuck into position. She moved through the secret passages behind the upper levels of the organ that she learned about from Mr. Pratt and Miss Whitney. There she hid in the organ loft, among the 700 brass pipes, some reaching 5, 10, 20 feet in height. From here, she had a wonderful bird's eye view of the banquet room. The banquet hall was the largest room she'd ever laid eyes on with a barrel vaulted ceiling high enough for a hawk to soar in. Rows of flags and pendants hung down from above like the throne room of an ancient king. The stone walls were adorned with medieval armor, cross spears, and rich tapestries that looked extremely old but well worth climbing someday. In the center of the room there was a massively long oak dining 
table ringed with hand-carved chairs intended for the Vanderbilts and 64 of their closest friends. That is the end of part one of chapter 16. In just a moment, we'll begin part two of chapter 16. Thank you for listening.